Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing transcription factors. Okay, right, so in the previous video what we saw was a, a basic introduction to epigenetics. So we saw all the points in the uh, central dogma of biology pathway, uh, so the pathway from DNA to RNA to protein, that uh, we can exert control over to uh, determine how much of a certain protein you're actually going to have within a cell. And we've discussed how important this is in determining uh, cell specialization, uh, because all cells have the same DNA, okay? Uh, so what actually determines how different certain cell types are from each other? Well, it's epigenetic changes rather than genetic changes. Okay, right. So, we're now going to focus in on transcription factors, which are a mechanism of controlling the expression of genes by controlling the um, transcription uh, of those genes. Okay, right. So, for this, we're going to have to study the control of transcription in a little bit more detail. So, upstream of all eukaryotic genes, okay, so once again, I'll draw... Uh, a double-stranded piece of DNA here, and I'll also have my gene here um, highlighted by this red box here, okay? Upstream of all genes in the eukaryotic uh, genome, you have a region of DNA known as the promoter region, okay? So this portion here, uh, which I'll highlight in blue, this is known as the promoter region, okay? Uh, now, the promoter region is not involved in actually being translated into protein. So it's not going to be converted into a sequence of amino acids. Uh, instead, it's involved in the epigenetic control of the expression level of the downstream gene. Now, how does it achieve this? Well, Basically, there was a portion that I sort of skipped over in the previous explanation of the central dogma of biology, which was how you actually loaded the RNA polymerase 2 onto the uh, DNA. Okay, so basically, it is the uh, promoter region at which you load the RNA polymerase 2 enzyme onto the DNA. So at the promoter region, RNA polymerase 2 is going to load onto the DNA, then it's going to work its way along the gene, synthesizing uh, a piece of mRNA which is complementary to the coding strand of the gene. Okay, now, um, this is how the promoter region exerts its control over how much mRNA you are actually going to produce uh, for this gene because if that promoter region has a very high affinity for binding to RNA polymerase 2, then RNA polymerase 2 will bind that all the time. You'll get mRNA being produced for the downstream gene all the time, and therefore you will get a, a larger production of the protein. Okay? So, um, this is how the promoter region is going to control the expression level of the downstream gene. On the other hand, if the promoter region has a really low affinity for binding to RNA polymerase 2, then RNA polymerase 2 will hardly ever bind here. It will hardly ever work its way along the gene, and you'll get hardly any pre-mRNAs produced for the downstream gene, and therefore you'll get hardly any protein being produced. Okay? Uh, so that's how promoter regions control the expression of downstream genes. Now let's talk about the concept of a transcription factor. Okay, so, a transcription factor, then, is a molecule which is capable of binding to the promoter regions of um, genes, basically, and they will bind to specific sequences of organic bases within these promoter regions. Okay, so that generally they have a uh, little region of the DNA which they'll bind to. It's generally around 10 organic bases uh, in length, Okay, it's usually often smaller than that, 6 to 10, around there, okay, and they will bind to that uh, sequence of organic bases which will be present in the promoter region. Okay, now they won't just do this for one promoter region of one gene, they'll bind to loads of different promoter regions because loads of those 
loads of promoter regions will have this same sequence of organic bases which they specifically recognize and bind to. Okay, so that sequence of organic bases which the transcription factor binds to is what's known as a recognition sequence. Okay, so if your promoter region contains the recognition sequence for a specific transcription factor, then that transcription factor will be able to bind to that recognition sequence within the promoter region. Okay, so, so far what we've got is that transcription factors bind to the promoter regions of a huge collection of different genes. Now, uh, what they will then do is alter the affinity of those promoter regions for binding to RNA polymerase 2. Now, the interesting thing is that at some of those promoter regions, they will increase the affinity of that promoter region for binding to RNA polymerase 2, okay? And therefore, RNA polymerase 2 will bind to that promoter region more often. You'll get, therefore, more mRNA being produced for the downstream gene, and therefore you'll get more proteins. So the transcription factor binding to the recognition sequence within that promoter region has actually increased the affinity of the downstream gene in that case, okay? So Sorry, the increase the expression of the downstream gene in that case. Um, whereas in other cases, on other promoter regions, the same transcription factor binding to the same recognition sequence, but now in a different promoter region, can then result in a decrease in the affinity of that promoter region for binding to the RNA polymerase 2. Therefore, the RNA polymerase 2 will bind to that promoter region less often, and you'll get less mRNA being produced for the downstream gene. And therefore, the transcription factor has actually decreased the expression of that downstream gene. Okay, so transcription factors then are molecules which change the gene expression uh, within a cell, and they change it by altering the transcription uh, levels of genes, basically. Okay, so transcription factors are very powerful molecules um, because they change the epigenetics of cells. They change um, which genes are going to be expressed at high levels and which at low levels. Okay, so transcription factors are very powerful in uh, specializing cells, in, which is a process known as differentiation. Okay, um, so because they change gene expression in cells, they are capable of differentiating cells into certain cell types. Okay, right. Uh, so, that's the basic concept of a transcription factor. So, transcription factors need to be able to bind to a certain sequence of organic bases, this recognition sequence uh, within DNA. Okay, so I now want to discuss the... Uh, mechanisms by which, well, the different domains which transcription factors can have, uh, which uh, allow them to uh, bind to DNA. Okay, so firstly, what we're going to start off with is a discussion of the minor and the major grooves of DNA, because all of these different motifs that we're going to talk about that are contained within transcription factors, they are all going to bind to the major groove of DNA, and I want you to have a decent understanding of what the major groove actually is, okay? So, it's often a confusion to people why the major and minor grooves actually exist at all. So I'm going to start off with an explanation for why they exist at all. Okay, so people's common misunderstanding and why they don't understand why the major and minor grooves exist is that they think that um, if you were to look at two nucleotides paired, it would look like this. Okay, so let's let this circle here represent the sugar phosphate backbone. Okay, and we're looking from above. Then we've got um, the um, organic base, one organic base here, and then we've got another organic base here, and then we've got uh, another sugar phosphate backbone. Okay, so if I draw a little picture of DNA and then tell you what we're looking at here. Okay, so here is DNA. Um, so uh, let me draw this now. So then we've got our DNA like so. 
Okay, uh, so what I'm effectively doing is taking a cross section like so, and we are looking down at the top of the DNA. This is what people think they would see. They think they will see it beautifully linear like this, with two organic bases in the middle, and then the sugar phosphate backbones on either side. So they think it's a nice straight line. And then what they think is that when DNA coils up into this helical structure, that what you do is, if I just draw a less expensive picture, a less time-consuming picture, okay, so I've now abbreviated the organic bases down just to being represented as a line like so. They think then what happens is that the next um, nucleotide pair that's stacked on top of this one will be at an angle maybe like so, and then the next one will go like this, and then you'll continue going on round. And then, if that was the case, surely what you would end up with is something that looked like this, okay? Which doesn't have a major or a minor groove, okay? The groove here is the same as the groove here, whereas on this picture what I've drawn is I've got a massive great groove here, and then a tiny little groove here. This is the minor groove here, and this is the major groove. Uh, this, well, not this, that's the back of the minor groove, but let me colour it in. Okay, so this is the major groove, the minor groove, rather, uh, and all of this, then, this is a major groove. Okay, right. Um, so, th the reason people struggle to understand why DNA has a minor groove and a major groove is because they think that the nucleotides are pairs are arranged like so, in perfect linear lines, okay, and it is not the case, okay, this is not what it would look like if we took a cross section through this, instead it would look like so, okay, so we've got the organic bases drawn once again here, okay, and now the um, sugar phosphate backbones come off at an angle like so, Okay, and they come off both on the same side, so they are not in a line like this, okay? This is why the minor and the major groove occur. When we are looking, so we're looking from one side, and at the present we've got a minor groove facing us. We are looking at this portion, okay? That is when this closed small bit is facing us from the front. When we see a major groove, we are looking at this side here, this major portion, okay, like so. That is what causes the major and the minor grooves, okay. So really what DNA is, is nucleotide pairs which look like this, okay. So I'll, again, draw a cheaper picture here. And then they're rotating on, you know, on top of one another. So when you go up to the nucleotide pair above, it will be rotated around a little bit like so, and then you'll continue on doing this, so the next one might be something like this, okay, and then it will continue going on, and if you were to look from this side, uh, you'd see this um, groove here, okay, which would go like so, it would go into uh, each of these, so this, it would originally be in this portion of this one, then it would be in this portion of this one, and I realise this is getting a total mess, and then it will be in this portion of this one, and that's the minor groove. That's what we're seeing here, okay? When we look at the DNA and see the minor groove, we are looking uh, at a um, nucleotide pair from this angle, basically, and that's what we're seeing here. Whereas when we look and see a major groove, we are looking now at a portion, uh, at a portion where there is a nucleotide pair, which uh, we're looking at this side from. Okay, this bigger side. Okay, so this nucleotide pair here is orientated the opposite way round compared to us, um, to this nucleotide pair here. Okay, so for this nucleotide pair here, I'll say it once again, we are looking at this side. For this nucleotide pair here, we're looking at this side. And that's the difference between the major and minor groups.
Now, um, the transcription factors are all going to bind within the major groove of DNA rather than the minor groove of DNA. And I want to try and explain why that is to you. Okay, you might just think, well, obviously it's because there's more space, but there's a subtler reason to why it had to be binding in the major groove rather than the minor groove. Okay, and this is the subtle reason. We want our transcription factors to bind to specific sequences of organic bases, okay? They don't just bind willy-nilly to DNA. They bind to specific sequences of organic bases, okay? So you have to have some specific sequence. I'll draw this here. Maybe you have to have TTA, CCG. Maybe that's the specific sequence. I'll draw the uh, complementary strand here. So A, A, T. GGC, like so on the complementary strand. Okay, right. Uh, so, you had these transcription factors bind to specific sequences, so they must therefore be interacting with the organic bases in the section of DNA that they uh, interact with. Now, the way that they bind to the DNA is through generally hydrogen bonds. Okay, and also hydrophobic um, interactions. Okay, now if you look at uh, organic base pairs on their minor groove face, okay, so if you look at organic base pairs on the minor groove face, you find that organic base pairs of adenine and thymine. Uh, compared to cytosine and guanine look pretty much identical from the minor groove. Okay, as far as being able to interact through hydrogen bonds and hydrophobic interactions, they look identical. Whereas if we look from the major groove, the potential for hydrogen bonds and hydrophobic uh, interactions um, are completely different for the two different types of uh, organic base pair. Okay, so if we're going to have a transcription factor which binds to a specific sequence of DNA via hydrogen bonding and hydrophobic interactions, it had to bind in the ma major groove because only in the major groove do these two different uh, organic base pairs here look different. Okay. So, let me explain that in more detail by actually drawing out the organic base pairs. Uh, 